this my die hard follower a son ordained to stand by me I think from the foundation of the world amen now he has been with me before the mandate was delivered so he came earlier than the mandate he must be part of the mandate that God ordained he's gone with me on motorbike he's gone ahead with me running to where I'm coming to let them know I'm coming home not that I'm not coming. And he has partaken of every bit of grace that God has made available to this commission. Amen? It's never caused me pain, oh. I have said, there are people who have not only caused pain. If they have a way of taking my life, they will take it. There are those who, if they have their way, they will take my life. Yes. But this one covenant song never cost me pain. I pray that God will bring your way those who will never cost you pain. <laughs> and may the Lord remove from your side those who are causing you high temperature. <laughs> Tonight you'll be seeing Brother Barry here who serves Dr. Copeland. He's been there with him 40 years. How many years? It's now 76. He's 76. He goes before him to any meeting to make sure things are in order. So I call him that young man. You'll be here again tonight. Now, Jerry Savell has been with Brother Copeland for 50 years. How many years? May the Lord get around you your own body. And your own journey. Yeah. So life will not be a burden for you. Yeah. Ministry will not be a pain to your heart. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Join me and welcome Bishop David Abuye yeah. as he takes us. Thank you, Jesus. Please give Jesus a very big, big, big hand. No one like him. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious name. Please wave your hand one more time. Let's thank God for the privilege he's given to us. First of all, to be called his servants. Let's thank him. We don't merit it. Grace found us. Let's appreciate God for it. And for bringing us to this 2019 International Ministers Conference. Let's appreciate him. To God be the glory forever. And once again, ask him to speak to you again in this short moment of sharing his word. Blessed be God forever. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. I can see somebody wants to clap for the Lord. If you do, please do that joyfully. First of all, I feel so humbled to receive the honor of God and of my Father at this moment, and for the privilege to be asked to share with us, not just from God's word, but from lessons I've learned from him. And I make bold to say this in the open. Sir, as I'm talking right now, I have your exhortation lines on the subject matter I'm asked to talk about. Um, he's here with me. So, I copy a lot. All I do is to be sure I copy it right. If you copy it right, it's all right. Praise the Lord. You know, sometimes photocopy looks so close to original <laughs> that they would think it is you that manufactured it. I remember many years ago, I was um, sent by him to represent him in a church in Port Accord. And when I made a statement that I got from his mouth, people applauded it. I said, can you see that right now? <laughs> I told them, when you clean up, God will show up. It was like something new from nowhere to them. 
some other years back, uh, a pastor was ministering in Kapanchan. And um, he caught a word and said it. And a member of the church who was in church said, oh, that's exactly, the spirit is one. That's exactly what was being spoken by God's servant. What am I saying? It's a privilege, it's a joy, and I don't take it lightly. Sir, my dear father, I appreciate you one more time. <laughs> my story is like that of um, Genesis 13, 5. And Lot also, which went with Abraham, was blessed. Had flocks and herds and tents. My position is not exactly his position, but it is similar. Similar in blessing, similar in lifting, and to the glory of God, I deeply appreciate it. Now, quickly in this workshop, we'll be doing some work, as it is being called. It's a workshop, so we're in a shop right now doing some work. Looking at covenant keys to next levels church growth. Covenant keys to next level supernatural church growth. I call it covenant because it's a covenant between God and us. But by way of introduction, let us be reminded that the church of Christ is ordained, ordained, please emphasize on that, to be an ever-growing and advancing church. Nothing can work against it. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus, who never changed, the same yesterday, today, and forever, said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. That statement has not changed. The gates of hell shall not, not may not. This expression is very vital because it will build in you a mentality that nothing can stop the church you are pastoring from growing. Your mentality determines your experience. Jesus said so. No gate of hell, irrespective of the city or the nation, the gate of hell shall not prevail. Also in Proverbs 4.18, the church of the justified is as a shining light. More and more. That's what we are meant to be, more and more. Somebody please say it will be more and more. More and more. more and more, not more and less or less and less. More and more. Again, let that get into your mentality and sit there. More and more. Because you can never get beyond your mentality. As a man thinks, so he becomes. And our thinking is affected by the supernatural information that we have access to. But what is supernatural church growth? Supernatural church growth can be described as growth as supernatural frequency or beyond human comprehension. Growth beyond human calculation. In the subject of increase, we have two categories. We have addition and we have multiplication. In addition, you can say two plus three. In multiplication, two times three. In addition, 10 plus 10 is 20. 10 multiplied by 10 is 100. As far as the church of Jesus is concerned, addition is slow motion or regular motion. Addition is natural. Yesterday, God's servant was telling us about when our church started in Kaduna, the growth rate was so low that according to him, if that growth, I mean, if that rate continues, the church will grow maybe after 100 years into 1,000. But suddenly, light came. From natural, it grew to supernatural. From addition, it grew into multiplication. Now, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. God was adding to them daily. Addition. But 
multiplication. Jeremiah 30, 19. Out of them shall proceed hands given and the voice of them that make melody. And I will multiply them and they shall not be small. Multiplication is God's ultimate, in, ultimate intention for the church. How much change of levels did the first church experience? We're all familiar with the growth rate from 120 that were in the upper room, suddenly 3,000 addition in one day. There are churches after this conference who will multiply at that rate. Yeah. Somebody who believes is saying a loud amen. Yeah. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, 3,000 men were added. Acts chapter 4, verse 4, 5,000 added. Then chapter 6, verse 7, it became a great company. 1344, almost the whole city, almost the whole city, almost the whole city, that will be someone's experience after this conference. <laughs> what are we saying? Next levels should not be an ambiguous thing that we think of. It is measurable in multiplication form. But there are fundamental things we need to know at this point. And that is, among others, next level supernatural church growth is born out of the participation of God and man. That's why we call it covenant. The involvement of the invisible and the visible. Divine and human participation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul speaking. I, Paul, have planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You can see man and God. Man has to do the planting and the watering before God will do the increase. It's a participation between God and man. God is the owner of the church and must always be acknowledged so. Psalm 127 verse 1 and 2, except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that builds it. Christ is the head of the church and must always be recognized so. Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. Only Jesus had the capacity to build a church. The church is not a man's property. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And of course, the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the harvest, must always be so celebrated God, the owner, must be acknowledged. Christ, the head, must be recognized. And the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the harvest, must always be celebrated. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. The harvest is ripe, ready for harvest. Therefore, pray ye, the Lord of the harvest, and that is the Holy Spirit, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The Lord of the harvest. We'll be focusing on the engagement of the church, or rather the pastor and the members of the church in saying to the growth of the church. And the reason is because God does not change. I'm the Lord, I change it not. He will always fulfill his own part. Jesus has not changed. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever. And the Holy Spirit will always, his eternal spirit, he does not change. In the light of this, and within the time we have, I want us to focus on four major areas where we need to be practically involved in saying to the growth of the church, the must do, the non-negotiable must do. And incidentally, each of these four begins with P. So if you like, call it four Ps that must be observed for continuous growth of the church. Number one is prayer. 
A praying church is always a growing church. No church grows without prayer base. The first church began with prayer and continued to grow as they continued to pray. Any pastor that dislikes prayer and fasting should forget about church growth. As soon as Jesus left, Acts chapter 1 verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. They continued. You see, what we continue is what results into sudden manifestation. The things of God are not meant to be done momentarily, but they are to be done continuously. As they continued, suddenly, chapter 2, they remained there in their prayer, and in verse 2, suddenly, suddenly, every sudden event begins with gradual movement. What you do gradually, but consistently, is what results into sudden result. Keep at it. Continuity was one of the secrets in the first church, which we are using as a case study right now. They continued. They continued. If we continue to do what they did, we will see what they saw. They continued to intercede, and as a result, they enjoyed intervention. Our intercession is what results to a heaven intervention. And as they prayed, the Holy Ghost came down. Every time we pray, the Holy Ghost is always attracted. The Holy Ghost is always interested. Everywhere people are praying, the Holy Ghost invites himself. And suddenly it was noise abroad, and the people gathered. Chapter 2, verse 6. When this was noised abroad, the people gathered. So number one publicity to church growth is prayer. Prayer. A praying church is about to grow. It's only a matter of time. Every praying church is about to grow. It's only a matter of time. Prayer was their practice. Chapter 3, verse 1, James and Peter, uh, and Peter and John, rather, they were on their way to the temple in the hour of prayer. In chapter 4, verses 29 to 31, they prayed. The place shook where they prayed because the Holy Ghost came down. And that resulted into multiplication. Chapter 6, they vowed, verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the world. And verse 7, and the church busted forth into another level of increase. Every praying church is a potential growing church. But to help us, just a few specifics, because we must pray our prayer with specifics. What are the things we're praying about? Number one, we are praying to destroy barriers that seek to stop the growth of the church. We are praying against the forces holding down people from being released from the captivity of the devil. In Luke chapter 11, verses 21 to 22, Jesus gave a picture that when a strong man harmed, kept his palace, the devil is that strong man. He keeps his captives. His goods are saved. But when a stronger man, it is in prayer that will exercise the stronger authority. When a stronger man than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he take from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided or released the captives. So we pray over our territories. We pray to destroy barriers. Sometimes ago, we discovered that in our church growth effort, there is a particular door 
at the back and at the side where people does not exceed an increase. Some particular door, towards the end, every time we gather in service, at that door, there's no extension. Empty seat. So I said, take the oil there. Go and anoint those doors. I told our pastors, while I stand at the altar, praying to release whatever is holding down those spaces. And suddenly, as we began to pray, the crowds were coming in to fill up the empty seat. There are forces that won't let church grow. Church growth is warfare. Church does not grow by gentility. It grows by violence. The violent take it by force. And we take it by force in prayer as we engage the force of faith. Wherefore, taking hold of the, of the weapon of faith, where we too shall be able to stop the fiery darts and quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. That's what we do in prayer, to stop the oppositions, to stop the mouths. There are some false lying spirit in the community where you are that gives false impression about the church. We had that testimony yesterday from God's servant. Church was not growing at the onset. And God said to him, come on, walk down the stream. And as he was returning, saw a thick layer. These thick layers are everywhere. That must be stopped. That must be removed. They must be stopped. In our various communities, in our various towns where we are, in the cities where we are, we need to engage. You are doing all you can and church seems not to be growing. You need to engage those forces. And that's, I want to say, by the permission of God's servant, it's one assignment each of us will have to carry out when you get back to your place. Go destroy the barriers. If it means engaging in fasting, why not? Among other specifics we need to engage in prayer is the bathing of new converts and establishing them. In Isaiah chapter 66, verses 7 to 8, we have to stay in prayer and travail in the same. Before she travailed, she brought forth a child. Before she cried, before she, she, the pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Who has had such a thing? That means it doesn't happen anywhere. It is as Zion travailed in prayer that she brought forth her children. So souls are never released without our travail in prayer. And even after they have been born into the faith, they must be kept through prayer. According to Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, Paul the Apostle said, My little children, of whom I traveled in birth again. So there was a before. I traveled in birth for them before, until Christ be formed in you. Now, when we pray, at first, Christ comes into them, but when we pray the second time, Christ is formed in them. Many of us have experienced this. Many souls saved. But where are they? You prayed for Christ to come into them. The life of Christ came. The nature of life came. But you have to pray for the character of Christ to be formed in them. So we pray prayer of establishment for the souls that have been saved. Why must we do that? Because after you have spoken to them, they've received Christ, Satan wants to drag them back into sin. And we see that a lot. They are challenged. They backslide. So you have to pray against distraction, against the forces that seek to drag them back so they can be established in the faith. So prayer is a continuous thing. As a matter of fact, prayer is the A to Z of church growth. The more we pray, the more levels we experience. What other are we to think are we to pray about? We have to pray about commanding multitudes to flock in into our assemblies. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 5 to 6, Say to the north, give up. Fear not, I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather them from the west. Say to the north, give up. And to the south, hold not back. Release our sons and our daughters. 
God showed me this scripture way back in 1988. When by God's privilege, I was sent by God's servant with an assistant to go to plant a church in Meduguri in 1987 May. Church was not growing. And God showed me this scripture. And as we began to call the people, church that started with four people, in one year, grew to 60 people. That was strange growth at that time. Say to the not give up. There are people that God has ordained to be in that church. You need to command them to come in prayer. You need to command them to come in prayer. And as you do, the Father will fulfill John 6, 44. He's the one who can bring them. Jesus will fulfill John chapter 10, verse 16. I have other sheep that are not yet in this world. Them also must I bring. Our prayer compels God to bring them in. And of course, as we pray, the Holy Ghost is engaged. As he begins to whistle to them to come. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 26. Heaven responds when we intercede to bring about intervention. That's why we must continue to pray. And of course, angels also are involved. Matthew 13, 39, as we pray, they hearken to the voice of our prayer. They go to the nooks and crowning to bring in the people. That's why in church growth to hear diverse testimony. Somebody will say, oh, I just saw somebody led me and showed me that church, so I came here. Somebody will say, I was inside the bus. And as the bus was going, I didn't know how I stopped in front of the church. So I, I entered this church, even though I don't like this church. I've had people say, I don't like that church. And the angel of God said, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not, you must go there. Amen. <laughs> you must go there. So it is our prayer that makes that happen. Number two thing we must engage in doing is preaching and teaching. Preaching. Jesus sent his disciples to preach. Luke 9 verses 1 and 2. Going. Every going church will end as a growing church. Our churches are not growing because we are not going. The first church was a going church, as Jesus commanded them. Interestingly, in all the Gospels, Jesus commanded us to go. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go ye therefore. Go ye therefore. You can't change the scriptures. Go ye therefore into all nations. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Go ye therefore. Go. It's a command. No one exempted. Go. Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke chapter 14, verses 21 and 23. He further analyzed that to us. Go out quickly, no delay, into the streets and lanes of the city and bring either the poor the poor, don't look for the rich. You know why the poor? Because the poor has a need. The poor. That's why, as I see my spiritual father does it, anywhere, street corner, last Saturday we were around the Brotrail, where we met some young girls, teenagers. Go everywhere. Go to the marketplace. A lot of times I stand inside Tick Market. We use our legs to enter the place. Because Jesus said, go and bring the poor, the poor, the poor, the maim, the halted, the hopeless. Go and bring them. Go to the streets, the lanes of the city. Go everywhere. Show me where people are. I'm ready to go. Go. And then in verse 23, if what more said, he said, go out into the highway and edges. So, the street, the lanes, the highways, and the edges. And there is no pastor here who doesn't have one of that around this church. Today, you don't have to go far to see souls hungry everywhere, looking for who will tell them the good news. Drug addicts are there. Harlots are there. People who are under different affliction, they are there, waiting for who will tell them to come. Go and compare them to come. Why? That my house may be filled. So church growth is not an ambition. It's response to the command of the law. 
Why do we want the church to grow? Because Jesus commanded us to do so. Go and bring them. Go and bring them. Go and bring them. That my house may be filled. That God might be honored. Because in the multitude of people is the honor of the king. So we have to obey the command to go. And when we go, we are to market the gospel. Now, I learned a lesson about two decades ago when we have the new generational bank came into Nigeria. Before then, any transaction you want to do with the bank, you have to go inside. And then they will give you different conditions. You know, you need passport photograph, you need CAC registration. But when the new generation banks came, they engaged marketers. Who goes from shop to shop, from organization to organization, marketing their bank to people. You say you don't have photograph, they say we have the camera here to snap you. No excuse. We don't have CSC registration, we'll help you, we know people there. All they are looking for is how to get your money. You open bank for your organization, they tell you you need to open personal bank account. When you are done, they say your wife will need to open. When you are done, they tell you they have a package that can cater for your children's school fees. <laughs> they were marketing and they were driving. Suddenly, they took over the old generation banks. And that's what Jesus commanded us to do. Go and market the gospel. So when you're on the street, you begin to bless the people. I learned that from my spiritual father. Because nobody hates to be blessed. When I go to the market, I speak relevantly to the market people. Today, God go bless on our business. You'll be hearing the men from different corners. 419, don't go enter your shop. No big grammar, no Bible holding. Talk to them in their relevance. I go to, you know, moto mechanic, mechanic workshop, and I tell them, no car will catch fire here. I go to plank shop where they are selling wood. In the name of Jesus, no fire incidents here. Because that's their greatest need. For the wood not to burn. When I go to communities in the neighborhood, no kidnapper will catch any child here. All of you are covered. Your children will do well. They will excel. They will. Everybody saying amen. And after saying the amen, you know, for you to secure this blessing, you need Jesus, who is your security. I have come to pray for you right now, but I can't guarantee that the blessing will continue. I want to leave with you a man that will help you to continue to enjoy the blessing. So how many of you want to give your life to this man, Jesus? They raise their hand, lead them to Christ. That's what Jesus told us to do. He said, when you go, bless them. Then preach the kingdom. Heal the sick. Deliver your prayers. Raise the dead. Then preach. And after preaching... How many of you have been blessed by the word you heard? And they raised their hand. Do you want the blessing to continue? Oh, yeah. I have finished with you now part A of my blessing. Part B will be on Sunday. How many of you want part B? They raised their hand. Okay. Meet me 6.30 a.m. on Sunday, 8.30 or 10.30. It's my desire to have stayed longer with you here, but I can see many of you are busy. You want to do one thing or the other, but I will promise you two hours solid on Sunday will be together. And then we we'll see them running down on Sunday. Why are we doing that? It's not enough to save them. We must keep them. No farmer finish harvest and leaves it in the field. He takes it to the store. That's why in the first church, they met daily in the temple, nurturing it the disciples, turning new converts to disciples. That's the place of teaching. We preach to prick them, to convict and convert them, and bring them in. And after that, we teach them to be established. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. They were teaching them. It's recommended for all of us to look for how to start our satellite fellowship, the home cell fellowship that serves as a basket. They don't have to go far. Church in the house, and then church in the temple, 
on whatever designated days you have for your services. In all probability, those who come into the cell fellowship are 50% already member of the church. Because there, the place is small enough to know you and the temple is big enough to accommodate you. Very crucial. We bring them by preaching, we establish them by teaching. Until they come to a point where they say like Jesus, I'm like Peter said to Jesus, Whither shall we go from you? You alone have the word of life. John 6, 66, verse 68. Number three, quickly. Is praising God and thanking God. These are the practices the church engaged. They prayed continuously. They preached and taught. And then they were praising God. Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, they were praising God always. And as they were praising God, God was multiplying them in line with Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 19. Out of them shall proceed thanksgiving. And in response, God will multiply them. Every thankful church is a growing church. Nothing reduces with thanksgivers. They were praising God, and God was adding to them. Additions to growth comes by thanksgiving. Continuous thanksgiving guarantees continuous growth. And finally, the number four P is planning and programming the way forward and upward. Planning. Planning. Planning secures the future. Programming keeps you busy. I have discovered that the reason why many, many pastors get discouraged is because they are not planning. Nobody plans and does not, is not eager to see what he's planning for. Planning gets you excited. Planning is a way of seeing into the future that others cannot see. Planning. Planning. Scheduled programs that will result into the growth of the church. Advertising Jesus. Program for those who have need for marriage. Program for those who have need for their miracle babies. Because that's what marketers do. They will give you information and give you expectation about what you're expecting. And we are marketers for Jesus. Let me quickly say this. You see, with God and in this kingdom, anything you don't announce to people, God does not confirm. Even Jesus... After Jesus returned with the power of the Spirit, you know what Jesus said? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. In case you don't know, let me tell you what I carry. It's not pride to announce what's available in your church. Here in this church, God changes the stories of people. You are advertising for Jesus. You are humble in your heart, but very bold in your presentation. Planning. Programming. Because according to Isaiah chapter 54, if you don't extend your place of enlightenment, you never see increase. Where preparation stops is where manifestation stops. Where planning stops is where growth stops. Isaiah chapter 54, verses 3 and 4. The first church was a planning church. It was a reasoning church. What you do in planning is reasoning, writing, and imagining, and all of that. Acts chapter 6, verse 3, they were a church that reasoned, to rise. There is no church that cannot rise if reasoning is engaged along with praying and preaching and thanking God. That's the way to make it work. And let me say this on the final note. Every pastor must beware of making excuses for stagnation. If you make excuse, you exclude yourself. You know, we live in a place where, you know, people don't go to church. That excuse has killed you already. About nine years ago, when God gave instruction to God's servant that we should start our church in Goshen, in Nasarawa State. No excuse. Far from town. Meanwhile, the churches in town remain. No excuse. No excuse. And as he would do, I sat down and studied about the church in the wilderness. And when I concluded the study, the statement came to me, people will come from anywhere and from everywhere. Suddenly, I started hearing testimony. I come to this church every Sunday from Kafanchan. 
I started hearing testimony. I come to this church from Suleja. I come from Guagalada. One day, somebody said, I come from, to this church every Sunday from Makodi. Why? No excuse. Distance, no excuse. I discovered how that people were running afoot on, on, you know, uh, after Jesus. No excuse. Buses or no buses available. No excuse. They must come from everywhere. They must come from anywhere. Once you make an excuse concerning the growth of the church, you have killed the growth. No excuse. Somebody say with me, no excuse. The church under your pastorate must grow. And if you have itinerant ministry, the same thing applies. If you are evangelistic, the same thing applies. Your crusade must increase. Attendance must increase. Miracles must increase. Everything must increase. All of us who desire this next level of growth, I see it happening to you. From time to time, I pray, God, the way you are walking in Canaan land, let it happen here. And God has never failed to do so. The grace of God at work here will go with each and every one of us. Yeah. Please rise to your feet with me. And if you got anything, just raise up your hand and give thanks to God. Give thanks to God. If you got anything, give thanks to God. If you got anything, give thanks to God. Give him thanks. Give him praise. Give him thanks. The faithful father. What he says he would do, he will surely do. Thank him from the depth of your heart. 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 In Jesus' precious name, we are prayed. Standing on the authority that backs up our spiritual father here, I decree that every church represented here will enter into new dimensions of growth. <laughs> By next year, when we come for the international conference again, testimonies upon testimonies. Testimonies of overflow upon overflow. Yeah. Wave your hand one more time.